welcome to Just This Morning Coffee. Okay, so let's return to uh, the seven basic plots. This will be Voyage and Return, part three. So uh, if you haven't seen Voyage and Return, part one and two, links are below. I'd suggest you watch that first. Uh, and we're going to wrap it up. We're going to wrap up the Voyage and Return plot type today so we can move on finally. Uh, to the quest archetype, archetype, which I'm very fascinated about. Okay, so uh, by quick review, I like to plot these out on a mountain. We've been working our way up the mountain, racks to riches, overcoming the monster, voyage and return, and we're climbing up the ladder of success. Once we get to comedy, that's the pinnacle of the first mountain, and we'll get into tragedy down into the quest valley and rebirth, and this is uh, encompassing entire an entire life cycle. That's my contention. Okay, so as a reminder, uh, we've been looking at uh, Alice in Wonderland, Wizard of Oz, Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe, Shawshank Redemption, The Matrix, but of course you can see all, this is a really, really rich plot type. Things that I haven't even talked about are Lord of the Flies and Orpheus and Time Machine and Gone with the Wind and uh, The Prodigal Son and Peter Rabbit, you know, so it's a very, very, it, it could, it could uh, take up a lot of your time. Uh, studying this plot type, which I think is very rich. Um, so where I left off last time, I was talking about the accuser and the role of the accuser uh, in this in this plot type. Um, the idea is that the, um, the 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 upside down world, the world of the special world. In in screenwriting terms, you've got the ordinary world, and then you've got the special world. So when Alice goes down the rabbit hole, when Neo takes the red pill. Uh, instead of the blue pill, uh, when uh, Dorothy gets taken away um, in the tornado, when the chi uh, children from the Chronicles of Narnia go through the wardrobe, they wind up in what I call the upside down world. Um, I think that's a good way to think of it. Uh, the, the visual symbolism of Alice in Wonderland is upside down, but there's also all sorts of other upside down motifs and elements, and it's this idea of the mirror the moon, the mirror, and it's associated with sleep and with death. So the idea is that at night, every day, you go through a little mini uh, death and rebirth. You die at night and go into this upside down mirror dream moonlike world. Uh, and then something happens there, which causes you to be renewed. And then you wake up the next morning in a, in a rebirth. Okay, so that's, I think, what this plot type is symbolizing. So you have, in this upside down world, your accuser antagonist, Pharaoh, uh, Mr. Mr. Smith, uh, the Warden, uh, the White Witch, they are all trying to keep multiplicity as multiplicity. In other words, keep it as uh, this, as a battery, as energy, as pure potential. So you can think of the, the, the antagonist of the upside down world, the Queen of Hearts, the White Witch, the warden, you know, all of these antagonist figures as the accuser, as the Satan figures of this plot type. And the pyramid is consisting of all of the slaves, you know, like the like the children of Israel in the book of Exodus. They are all working towards the glory and power and fame or whatever it is that uh, that these people are trying to do. You know, they, they are the pharaohs of this plot type, you might say. And uh, within this world of potential, you can think of it that way. You're going down into the soil. That's where all the nutrients are. That's where all of the uh, material that we would need to sprout up is. But down there, there's competition for identity. There, there basically is the seed that goes down there going to start eating the world around it and then use that to turn that into the stalk of the tree. Um, or is it going to be eaten by the worms? You know, and so this is why I think the Satan figure um, is seen as somebody that eats the dead, a snake that eats the dead. That's worm food. You, when you die, you become worm food. Uh, all of these symbols, all these metaphors are for this idea that down here in the upside down world, what the main danger, the main danger is that you will dissolve into nothing. That's the main danger. Okay. So... <clears throat> Andy Dufresne. Uh, remember, we talked last time about the world tree and about how in all of these different cultures, there's this idea of going down into the underworld through the base of the tree and going down into the root system. Um, so Andy Dufresne winds up down there through, through a death of some kind, just like you wind up in your dream through a death 
<laughs> because uh, you went to sleep and now you're in your subconscious world, right? So it's the same idea. And now you're going to try to sprout up and, and, and grow back up and get back up to the, to the, up to the right side up world. Okay. Now, what do I mean when I say you're in danger of losing your identity? So let's take, let's, let's start off with a clip from Shawshank. And this is going to be after the warden has shut down Andy Dufresne's knowledge that he's actually innocent of the crime and he has the proof of it. Uh, the warden, of course, who is, again, wanting to keep his pyramidal uh, structure intact, um, is going to push down. He does not want Andy to prove his innocence and sprout up and, and exit the, the prison. Why? Well, on a practical level, it's because he's running a scam and he's hand, having Andy launder his money. That's this idea, the battery. You know, Andy is the battery for the power of, of the warden, right? He can't do his, his, uh, his financial schemes without Andy's expertise, right? <clears throat> so that's, that's part of it. And the other part of it is just that all of the other multiplicity around here also wants to eat you, right? So there's competition, there's bullies down in this realm. So these guys, the warden, or not the warden, but the, the guards, they're bullies. They want to push you down too, you know? And so nobody wants you to go up. It's that whole, you know, crabs in a bucket thing where none of the crabs can climb up out of the bucket because another one will always pull it down. That's the, the, the kind of idea. Okay, so what we're going to look at now is a scene from Shawshank uh, where uh, he loses his hope and he gets put even darker in, you know, he's already down in the prison, but now he's going to go into the deep, dark death, the mouth of the snake hole, uh, the actual hole <laughs> uh, in, in the prison. And you can see, okay, it's his identity that's at stake. Who is he? Is he going to dissolve into nothingness? So let's take a look at that. Solitary, a month. Yes, sir. Hot. What's the matter with you? It's my life. Don't you understand? It's my life. Get him out. Get him it's out. It's my life. A month in the hole. Carter. It's the longest Jay. damn stretch I ever heard of. You didn't pull the trick, and you certainly didn't convict him. Well, are you saying that Andy is innocent? Well, it looks that way. Sweet Jesus. Edward. Yeah. Board of Education. Right here. Son of a bitch mailed it. Come on, will you throw that away, please? Right here. Well, shit. Kid passed. C plus average. This conversation just between us. We got a situation here. I tell you, son, this thing really came along and knocked my wind out. The right thing to do. Hard to know what that is. I need your help, son. There can't be the least little shred of doubt. I have to know if what you told to frame was the truth. Absolutely. trying to escape. We just have to put it behind us. I'm done. Everything stops. Nothing stops. Well, you will do the hardest time there is. I'll pull you out of that one bunk, Hilton, and cast you down with the sodomites. In the library? Gone. You understand me? Or am I being obtuse? Hmm. Wow. <laughs> Very interesting. So, the accuser, remember, um, Andy's going down. There's two, two levels of eating here. And I, that's why I think this symbolism of the snake that eats the dead is so apt. Remember, Andy goes down here and he starts polishing the rocks, polishing the 
rough hewn, uh, pure potential rocks into identifiable pieces. So he's putting identity into formless matter. That's what he's doing, right? He's he's turning formless and void, tohu wabohu matter, into chess pieces that have names. So that's how you go from nothing to something or from nobody, no one to someone. And so he's trying as the seed here, right? He needs to eat the people around him and gather them in to his unity and have them grow up with him. So you notice he wants to get the, the high school diploma uh, for this other prisoner by using the music, education, reading, the library. All of that is designed to turn these prisoners into, uh, into people and so that they can grow up and, and, and get out of the underworld as well. And it is the accuser, the warden, who, who eats these people. So if you see that scene where he's talking to Billy and then the guard shoots him, that's him eating Billy. Okay, so it, Andy was trying to eat him in, in, in the sense of, I'm going to educate him. I'm going to uh, uh, turn him into to a, a normal citizen, you might say. Or is the accuser going to do it? Okay, so that's what goes on down in the underworld is this, you know, are you going to gather people into you or are you going to have them ripped away and eaten by this serpent here? And so when he winds up in the hole, remember the first time he was in the hole, he had Mozart in his head and he said it was the easiest time I've ever done because he had Mozart in his head. Music. He had Andy. pattern. He had uh, beauty in his head. Andy? I have no idea to this day what those two Italian ladies were singing about. But once Billy is taken away, once the hope is taken away by this accuser, because now we're in the nightmare stage, and that's when you get the full wrath of this of this figure against you, um, he is in danger of dissolving down into nothing. And he's going to be what? He's going to be invisible. <laughs> Or he's going to dissolve, you know. So isn't that crazy? In this plot type, you have this reoccurring motif of, in Andy's case, he didn't physically dissolve. But quite often you do have characters who are physically dissolving. Let's take a look at a scene from, uh, from Spirited Away. some food from this world or else you'll disappear. Now chew it and swallow. There you go. You're all better. I'm okay. You see? Wow. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So so she she starts to turn invisible. First of all, she says, "I'm dreaming." And that's yes. Yes, you are. That's what this plot type is about. It's about entering into the dream world, okay? Uh, and then she starts to turn invisible. She starts to dissolve. Now, it's I think that metaphorically, symbolically, that's the same thing as what was happening to Andy Dufresne in Shawshank Redemption. The identity, of course, in Spirited Away, it's all about names, remembering your name, forgetting your name. The queen of the underworld takes your name. Um, so it's naming and identity, and losing that in the underworld. And what's the remedy? You have to eat something in order. And, and again, I, I just think that this is what's happening. You're a seed down there and you start to eat the soil around you. And as you do, you start to sprout roots. And as you start to sprout roots, you start to gather more unity out of multiplicity until you can poke up, poke your head up back into the right side of the world. And so that's what the anima figure He's, he's a little voice of wisdom, and he's saying, okay, you, you need to start now eating the things around you in order for your identity to stay and, and for that to grow. And otherwise, you're going to get eaten by everything around you, and you'll just turn into worm food. Uh, 
this worm, <laughs> food for this worm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so now let's take a look at uh, Back to the Future. If we could somehow harness this lightning into the flux capacitor, next Saturday night, we're sending you back to the future. That is good. I can spend a week in 1955. I can hang out. You can show me around. Marty, that is completely out of the question. You must not leave this house. Anything you do could have serious repercussions on future events. Marty, have you interacted with anybody else today besides me? Yeah, well, I might have sort of bumped into my parents. Let me see that photograph again of your brother. Just as I thought. Look at your brother. His head's gone. Erased from existence. Erased from existence. <laughs> but that's what was going to happen to Andy Dufresne, too. He was going to be erased from existence. He would cease to be Andy Dufresne, the former person that he once was, the, the banker, the upstanding citizen. He would be erased and uh, turned into this for the warden, part of the pyramid, part of the pyramid for the warden, the king of the underworld, the accuser, the worm that eats the dead. Okay, And so that, <clears throat> that's why this book is open to the book of Exodus. You know, he hides his rock hammer, his tool of escape in the Bible, and the Bible page is open to the book of Exodus because he's doing exactly the same thing that Moses and the children of Israel did in the story of Exodus. Okay. And isn't it funny? that the name of the dance is the under the sea dance, right? So again, it's this world, this notion uh, that even Robert, look, I don't even know if Robert Zemeckis did this on purpose. I think that it's just tapping into some kind of a subconscious unity um, that causes him to decide, oh yeah, let's call it the under the sea dance. Let's use the invisibility or the dissolving motif, right? And it just lines up with these archetypes. It's just fascinating to me because I, I guarantee you if we were to, to talk to the screenwriter and talk to Robert Zemeckis, he would not be telling you that he did all of this stuff consciously. But I don't think you have to do it consciously. I think this is this is a universal thing that you're, you're tapping into. <clears throat> okay, so solidity versus invisibility. You have to eat those that are around you or you get eaten by the snake. That's where we left off. All right, so how do you get out of the underworld? Now... One thing that I find so fascinating about this as well is that there's this idea of magical weapons. When the, the hero goes down into that underworld, there's a sense that they have a certain superpowers. You know, they're, they're superheroes in a certain way. Um, why is that? That's the question that I have now. Is it like when you're in a dream and you, can, you have certain abilities in, in your dream that you don't have? Uh, in your conscious life, maybe it's something like that. Um, Neil learns Kung Fu in a way that would never happen in the right side up world. He can learn it in the Matrix. Um, Marty McFly knows how to play songs that never have been sung yet. He knows the future, you know, so he's got this magical ability. The uh, children from the Chronicles of Narnia are given gifts by Father Christmas that wind up being magical. Um, even in Castaway, you know, he, he finds remnants, little, little, little things from the, from the, from the, the land, from the upper world, from the right side up world, like these skates. He's living in a world that has no technology, but yet he gets these little, little magical weapons, these little gifts the, um, from the world of the right side up, from the world of civilization in this case. Um, Red, he's able to, he's the guy who can get you things. He gets the rock hammer for Andy, which he finally uses to escape. So what's going on here with these magical weapons? I think what it is, is it has something to do with logos over here, fire or the sword or anything kind of sharp like a sword and um, spirit over here, uh, which is more um, music, uh, clouds, water, mist, spirit. Um, symbolized by the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud that you find guiding the children of Israel through the desert in the book of Exodus. Okay, so <laughs> let me let me explain. Um, 
Okay, so let's start with spirit um, slash music. Okay, so um, like I said, there's a sense that these magical weapons come from the right side up world into the world of the upside down and they provide some kind of a function in that upside down world. In this case, the music, I think the music is a little representation of right side upness in the world of the upside down. So aesthetically right side up, morally right side up, and patterned in a right side up kind of way. Okay, so that's that's what I think the, the magical weapon of music uh, does for you. So let's take a look now at a scene from Shawshank Redemption. I take it. Dear Mr. Dufresne, in response to your repeated inquiries, the state has allocated the enclosed funds for your library project. This is $200. The library district has generously responded with a charitable donation of used books and sundries. Please stop sending us letters. Good for you, Andy. I have no idea to this day what those two Italian ladies were singing about. Truth is, I don't want to know. I like to think they were singing about something so beautiful it can't be expressed in words. And I tell you, those voices soared higher and farther than anybody in a great place dares to dream. And for the briefest of moments, every last man at Shawshank felt free. Open the door. Open it up! Hey, look who's here. Maestro. Hey. They broke the door down before I could take requests. Was it worth it? <laughs> Two weeks in the hole? Easiest time I ever did. Right, a week in the hole is like a year. Damn straight. I had Mr. Mozart to keep me company. He's in here. In, in here. That's the beauty of music. They can't get that from you. Didn't make much sense in here. Here's where it makes the most sense. You need it so you don't forget. Forget that there's something inside that they can't get to, that they, they can't touch. What are you talking about? Hope. What are you talking about, Andy? What is he talking about? <laughs> Hope? is what he says. But let me submit to you that he is talking, he is talking about this. He's talking about spirit. And music oftentimes represents that in these kinds of stories. Um, there's the, you, you, you always have to remember, you're talking about the upside down world and the right side up world. So in the upside down world, in the world of the prison, what does Andy say that music does? It reminds you of the right side up world. And so there's always this motif. There's a very famous scene in a C.S. Lewis book called The Silver Chair. And what is the silver chair? The silver chair is a place that go down into the upside down world, into the underground. There's a prince there and he says, for one hour a day, I go insane. And so they tie me up on this silver chair so that I can't break free when I'm in the throes of insanity, right? Well, it turns out through the story that you find out that that's actually, he's living in an, in an insane world. And that one hour of the, of the day is the only hour of the day that he's sane when the spell is broken. The spell by who? The, the, the white witch, <laughs> the, the accuser for this plot type, right? So in this case, the warden, of course, wants everybody to be hopeless wants everybody to be insane uh, or upside down um, and not to remember the right side of the world. Now, the motif that you find in the Bible, I, I, I said that this relates to the book of Exodus, but if you think about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, 
coming into your heart. What's he say? It's in my head. It's in my heart. You can't take that away. I was there in the hole, in the depths of death, like Jonah in the belly of the whale. And I had the song. What happens in the story of Jonah when he goes into the belly of the whale? Very famously, he sings a song. <laughs> so the song, the music, it, it has this spirit of the right side up world. And remember, he also says memory. You know, this is to remind you. This is this is what's what happens all through the Bible, where they're singing songs, they're doing rituals, they're doing things associated with that spirit to remind them of what? Who they are, who they are. So it's identity. It's to remind Andy that he's Andy and to remind him of what his potential is, who who he can become if he has ever escapes this this world. And, and so whenever you find yourself in one of these stories in, in that upside down world, that's the inspiration. That's how you start to, to pull yourself out. Okay, so that's the one side of it. Okay, no, in Castaway. Let's just look at that scene real quick in Castaway uh, because you actually have, very interestingly, you have the spirit and the logos as magical weapons also in Castaway. So let's take a look at that. Albert R. Miller. Not Alan. Albert. Okay, so what did we see there? Um, so first of all, uh, you see the same uh, setup as in Shawshank, um, where you have the death of someone. Uh, and notice that he didn't know his name. So again, death and loss of identity, loss of name, all of those things are related. So Alan, who he thought was a, a different person, um, dies and he buries him and then he writes his name. This is... He still has the identity. He still has the right side up world, the identity of the right side up world. This is also symbolized by the fact uh, that he doesn't open all of the FedEx packages. He covers them, uh, covers them with the, uh, the plastic from the inflatable raft. Why? <laughs> it's because he thinks maybe he's going to still do his job. He's going to get rescued and he's going to still deliver those packages. He still has that, that identity from the other world, just like Andy Dufresne has the still the identity of the banker from the other world. Um, but then what happens is he gets turned back by the storm. Uh, he gets knocked down by the antagonist, which in this case is nature itself, um, which wants to eat you and dissolve you just like the dead man that he finds that winds up becoming, once again, that motif of worm food, right? Eating the dead. Um, and so he needs something the same as Andy does, a little bit of music, a little bit of spirit, a little bit of wind to come along and give him what? The same thing Andy needs, a little bit of hope. So he does not open this package with the wings on it. And now you'll see a, a motif in Castaway where you can literally uh, follow these wings uh, as they take him uh, back to the to the normal world off of the island. Um, so, so I think that's kind of what's going on. Now, that's the one side of it. That's the spirit side. Now, I think what you have to also think of it as is uh, um, 
a bolt of lightning coming down, just like in the clock tower of Back to the Future. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of inspiration that comes from, uh, from the above. That relates to the flip side of the magical weapon, which is the Logos slash sword, symbolized by the pillar of fire and the word, the Logos, the word. Okay. <clears throat> now, to understand this, uh, we have to go back a little bit into back into the Bible, as the warden would want us to do. <laughs> um, okay, so what was the sign that was on the wall of the warden's office? His judgment cometh and right soon. And Andy agrees with this, okay? And the judgment that comes winds up being at the hands of the magical weapon, the sword-like magical weapon, the little rock hammer that Andy ends up happening. So in order to understand this, we have to look back. Um, these are a bunch of icons of the expulsion from paradise. And the, there's a cherub there. And the, the cherub is blocking Adam and Eve from re-entering paradise. So there's this idea that once you leave the place of tranquility, once you leave the place where everything is right, everything is for you, all of the food is good to eat, all of the animals are safe and domesticated, everything is safe, into a world of thorns and thistles and danger and murder and uh, uh, sin and death, there's something blocking you from going back into that paradisal world. And it's the cherub with this sword. You see it in all of these different icons. And then later you get icons of Christ with a sword. And, and, and that's based, of course, on the, um, on the passage that says, I, I came to bring a sword. I came to bring a sword. So what... What does that mean? So the fire sword idea. Now, the Old Testament word for sword is cherub, actually. Uh, so that's the function of the cherub, is to divide between that which is safe and unsafe. And it has something to do with this judgment. Um, there's a passage in Hebrew that says the sword, and it's talking about the logos, the word, divides bone and sinew, like a very, very, uh, very, very uh, scalpel-like division of what? Between two things, maybe between good and evil, maybe between uh, uh, right and wrong, um, maybe between worthiness and unworthiness, something like that. And so the sword, when it comes down, that has something to do with killing off, slicing away, pruning away, that which will not allow you to grow up and 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 get reborn in, into the upside uh, into the right side of the world it's something something to do with that the warden here is actually one of is actually the piece that is pruned away from andy andy is is kind of all mixed up with the warden just like the uh, the wheat the wheat and the weeds in the uh, parable of the new testament and then the sword cleaves him away he experiences judgment. He experiences judgment as a result of this sword that Andy brings down into the underworld in the form of the Word of God and the rock hammer. They're all together in, in the story. Um, so let's take a look first. I, I think you, you, you know the story of Shawshank Redemption. I don't think I need to necessarily show that because um, I showed it in the last video. But let's look actually at Castaway and see what is the sword, what is the Logos magical weapon in Castaway. You wouldn't match by a chance, would you? The air got to it. The air got to it!
She's much prettier in real life. Okay, so what did we see there? Um, all right, so the, so if this if the wings are the spirit, the magical weapon of hope, similar to the uh, the way that music is is used in Shawshank Redemption, then you might think of the ice skates here as well as the the uh, association with fire as the logos. Okay, so what what do we mean by that? Okay, so. Um, Basically, the sword, the cherub, um, in the Bible is used as, a, as an instrument to separate um, life from death, you might say. So when, when he first opens the package there, one of the packages is a dissolution of divorce, a dissolution of marriage, so divorce papers. Okay, the, the person that Tom Hanks is wife in this uh, Helen Hunt winds up marrying is the dentist. Uh, the toothache, uh, so it's it's really no not hard to see that the filmmakers mean for the toothache to represent the decaying relationship between Helen Hunt and the Tom Hanks character, you might say. Okay, so the, the ice skates now, this little piece of technology that divides and separates and cuts from the upside down, uh, from the right side up world, into the upside down world um, is used to finally kill off the old Chuck, you might say, the one that is represented by that toothache. So it's a it's a uh, it's a pruning metaphor, and the fire uh, and Wilson, you know, you it's 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 the same idea as the sword, the purifying fire, the fire burns away that which is unpure, that which is, does not belong to your identity, that which is not part of you, and refines you away so that you can grow up into the person that you're supposed to grow up into. You're the seed, and you need to be pruned, you need to be refined, etc., etc., etc. And so the, the fact that, um, you know, Wilson here presided over the invention of fire in Chuck's world, um, and then the fire itself... Uh, um, becoming a, a, a motif and a theme in this. Immediately following that, you have the ice skate, the sword, lopping off the old, uh, you know, cutting away uh, the old Chuck. Um, so, so that's kind of the 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 idea. Now let's let's take a look at uh, Shawshank Redemption and the use of the ice pick um, uh, to see uh, uh, the parallels there. I understand you're a man that knows how to get things. I wonder if you might get me a rock hammer. A what? Well, if it was a toothbrush, I wouldn't ask questions. I'd just quote a price. But then a toothbrush is a non-lethal object, isn't it? Rock hammer is about six or seven inches long. Looks like a miniature pickaxe. Pickaxe? So I'm a rock hound. Or maybe you'd like to sink your toe into somebody's skull. No, I have no enemies here. Wait a while. And it was right. I finally got the joke. It will take a man about 600 years to tunnel under the wall with one of these. No friend. Here you bark. Man missing on tier two, cell 245. Damn it, Dufresne, you're putting me behind. I got a schedule to keep. Oh, my holy God. What do you mean he just wasn't here? Don't, am I blind, Hay? No, sir. Lord, it's a miracle. 
Man up and vanish like a fart in the wind. This is a conspiracy. And everyone's in on it! Andy Dufresne escaped from Shawshank Prison. All they found of him was a muddy set of prison clothes and an old rock hammer. I remember thinking it would take a man 600 years to tunnel through the wall with it. Old Andy did it in less than 20. Oh, Andy loved geology. Geology is the study of pressure and time. I guess after Tommy was killed, Andy decided he'd been here just about long enough. Andy crawled to freedom through 500 yards of shit-smelling foulness I can't even imagine. Just shy of half a mile. The next morning, a man nobody ever laid eyes on before strolled into the main national bank until that moment he didn't exist except on paper he had all the proper id and the signature was a spot-on match mr stevens visited nearly a dozen banks in the portland area that morning severance pay for 19 years Okay, so first of all, Red was actually correct there in the beginning, in the first part of that clip, where he said that the rock hammer can be used as a weapon. In fact, it was used as a weapon uh, because symbolically it's tied in with this Logos idea, the refining fire of the word, and the idea of judgment. Okay, um, I just think it's, it, it's, it's so fascinating. Um, so the, the, the idea is that this weapon um, prunes away and, or refines away um, that which is not uh, worthy of the right side up world there down in the upside down. Um, it's it's on, a, on an organic level, you might think of it as the discernment of that seed to know which nutrients to take in and which nutrients are not, uh, you should not take in. Another motif in this uh, plot type is poison this, you'll see this in Alice in Wonderland. Poison versus the, the right kind of food. So, so again, it's, it's this discernment thing. And um, so the, <laughs> the, the idea of the sword winds up being this notion of um, you have to be worthy of uh, escaping the upside down. So... Um, Andy winds up using the the rock hammer to not only polish up the the little uh, soapstone and alabasters into proper things that are named like chess pieces, bishop, knight, rook, etc. Um, he also, if you notice, has a little death and resurrection there when he gets put in the hole. He loses his hope, but then he's got that scene that I showed you in the last video where he says to Red, "You should get livy busy living or get busy dying." This is the same kind of speech that you see Christ giving to the disciples, saying, here I am, I'm about to go die, knowing that there's going to be, that death is actually the exit from the upside down world. So death and life are the same thing. Death to the old upside down way, the, the, the world of, 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 of um, criminals and uh, th thick as thieves, um, uh, motif and language, right, into this world of new life, just like the seed that pops up out of the ground. And in so doing, um, you wind up um, leaving behind that which is not worthy. So, you, so there's, there's a sense that at the very end, at the very last, remember, we've gone through in the last video, last two videos, from the anticipation stage, through the dream stage, into the frustration stage, and we've been in the nightmare stage. 
That's where everything is, is at its absolute worst and you're under the full attack of the of the antagonist, the accuser, the Satan figure who wants to eat you and consume you and cause you to decay and remain down there in death. It's almost as if like when you when you fall asleep, the thing that wants to keep you there, not to wake up the next morning and go about your day, but to remain in the dream world. Um, and so you'll find this, I'm not going to show you scenes, but Alice in Wonderland, Kafka's The Trial, um, uh, you know, all of these different movies that have a, or, uh, you know, a trial motif at the end. And it's this idea that the that the protagonist needs to have turned into something that's, or someone that's worthy of leaving the upside down world. And that's exactly what Andy does, if you notice. Um, he had, he walks out of the prison after tunneling through using his magical weapon of uh, the sword, the, 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 the ice pick. Or I, I keep saying ice pick. It's a rock hammer. <laughs> Red calls it an ice pick at one point. Um, so he tunnels out with that, and then he, he emerges into the new world with a new name and a signature and an identity. Okay? Again, so that's that's what it is. That's, that's the, the motif here is how do you become a person with a name and an identity that is worthy of re-entering back into paradise? So, so think of, again, that, that motif of the sword. Oh, sorry, I'm not showing you the, <laughs> the sword here uh, that is dividing Adam and Eve after the uh, consuming of the wrong thing, consuming of the poison, you might say, both in thought and literally with the, uh, with the fruit from this world of paradise. And then the story then is how do they, they need another sword on this end to cleave away that which is not worthy from them so that they can go back in. I mean, on, on, on a very simple level, uh, you understand this principle. Let's say you curate your living room and it's all perfect and nice and everything. There's no poison in there. There's no sharp objects. Everything is nice, okay? And you go out into the world and you acquire all this mud and sharp objects and everything out there working in the world. And then you want to go back into the living room, but you don't take off your boots and you're going to track all this mud through the living room. Just a simple, simple, simple metaphor like that. Obviously, there's a sense that you cannot have that paradise, that clean living room, without cutting off the death from you before you enter back in. That's why you have to shed those outer layers of protection that you use when you went outside when you go back inside. That's why you have to take off your boots. That's why you have to have a mud room in your house if you live in a place where it rains a lot. I mean, it's it's really, I think, that simple of, a, of an idea, of a metaphor. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now I'm going to show you the end of Castaway, and we're going to wrap this up. So the final escape from the Upside Down. We just saw Andy Dufresne do it, Okay. And, and there's a sense that you can understand this notion of the trial. Um, at the end of the Gospel of John, the, in the story, Christ gets put on trial by Pontius Pilate and the Sanhedrin. But if you read that story closely, you'll see that slowly, slowly things are shifting around and shifting around, where by the end of the scene, you realize that it's actually Christ who's putting them on trial, not them putting him on trial. And it's very genius the way it was written and the way it, it, it unfolds in the drama of that story. And I think that's the same thing that's going on here is that um, the, the world of the upside down needs to be put on trial. And that's what happened with the warden and Andy Dufresne. Andy Dufresne was this. He was the one who had the sword and he was the one bringing judgment. And then the warden, of course, was uh, uh, fell under the sort of judgment in the in the story um, because Andy proved himself worthy of living in the right side of the world. He did not sin. He was the only innocent man in Shawshank. And so that allows him to be to redeem the only guilty man in Shawshank and also to condemn the powers and principalities of that fallen world. You might think of it that way. Okay, but how now, and I'm telling you, just go and watch the end of all of these movies. There's going to be a trial scene. And that's what's going to happen. It's the queen of the underworld that's going to wind up being condemned by the trial, not Dorothy or not 
um, not uh, Alice in Wonderland. Okay, and it's 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 the upside down world that gets put on on trial as long as the hero is worthy. Okay, so how does that happen in Castaway? So I'm going to show you the end. Remember the the wings here represent the spirit and they represent hope. They represent the same thing that music represented in Shawshank Redemption. And then when this uh, little bit of the outhouse shows up and he's, he looks at Wilson, he says, yeah, this could work. What does he do? He turns it into a sail and he uses that hope, the same as Andy used the hope of the music and the hope of the Zewantanejo to escape. And it's interesting, isn't it, that Andy, according to Red, had to crawl through shit through that sewage tunnel in order to emerge. What's this? This is an outhouse. He has to use the shit <laughs> and crawl through that in order to get over the waves of, of, of chaos that are trying to force him back into death, into the island, right? Uh, so I just, uh, I can't believe how, how, these, how these motifs just keep coming up and coming up. <laughs> Similarities, the more you look for them, the more you find. Um, okay, but now I wanna talk about this. This is this is the whale, the eye of the whale. So let's let's watch the scene and uh, and then we'll discuss. Bakersfield. work. Two, 44 lashings. 44 lashings. So. Wilson, well, so we're going to have to make a hell of a lot of rope. I know. Yeah, I know. I know where there's 30 feet of extra rope. But I'm not going back up there. Okay, so do you see now uh, the similar motif here of uh, hope and despair, right? So first of all, he talks about rope and lashings uh, after he finds this little bit of hope, this, this sail, um, you know, that, that really um, he winds up, of course, um, uh, painting or drawing this, these wings onto this. So this becomes his wings. Um, but then uh, what does he say uh, to Wilson? He goes... Uh, we need 44 lashings. Okay, that is that is a reference to the lashings of Christ. Um, I think you have to say that because why would they put that in the script otherwise? Um, so the, so there is this, this um, uh, the, the, there's a motif uh, of, of the passion, you know, a reference there. And then, um, of course, there's the difference between hope and despair. And despair is represented by this little dummy who uh, he used as a test to see if he could hang himself from that tree at the very top. Okay, and so this is the trial now. Now think of it that way. Is he now, has he grown into, uh, he, he cut away the, the old Chuck, and that was the, the use of the ice skate slash sword to, to uh, get rid of the, the impacted tooth, which represents the old Chuck. And now he's turned into to, to this companion of Wilson and for some reason decided not to, uh, uh, to hang himself from that tree, and he's following the hope, just just the same way that Andy Dufresne says, "It's time to get li busy living, or get busy dying. Do one or the other, not 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 uh, not waffle in between." And 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 both of them in the in these uh, stories follow the path of hope. That's what they do. Okay, so now let's keep watching. Okay, he's going to construct the raft. He's going to start to go out to sea, and the trial. He'll have one last trial. Uh, before it is deemed that he is worthy of, uh, of, of escaping this thing. Here we go, Wilson. You don't have to worry about anything. You just hang on. Get 
Okay, so right there, the whale, so he, he, he uses hope to get across the waves away from the, the forces of antagonism that have been keeping him down in death. And then the whale comes up and you see the eye of the whale looking at him. What is that about? Now, it, there's a sense that he just passed a test, which was that he didn't uh, hang himself from that tree. The, the same as, as, as Andy didn't hang himself um, like James Whitmore did, the character uh, played by James Whitmore in Shawshank. So he passed that test, and he's following the hope. He's following the wings. Uh, but now we see the whale, the eye of the whale looking at him. And what is that about? I think it, what it is, is the whale is looking at him as if this is, this is uh, the I am. This is, uh, this is God. This is, uh, this is existence looking at him and saying, I've got my eye on you. You've got one more, one more uh, test to pass. Okay, and what is that final test? It's what happens immediately next. Let's take a look at that. Okay, and now we get the final rescue of Chuck on the ocean. Um, so what, what were we seeing there? Well, why have a scene where Wilson, the, ball, the volleyball, his imaginary friend, floats off and he has a big temper, tan temper tantrum and, and, and cries and, and, and everything? Um, well, I think what it represents is the final test that this whale... <laughs> as if you know the, the the this whale was saying uh i've got my eye on you you've got one more test and and i think what it represents is the total 180 degree proof that this is the new chuck and not the old one the old chuck from when again with this motif of the upside down world and right side up world chuck was living upside down out in the real world uh he wouldn't re he couldn't remember people's names he saw people as means to ends and not ends in themselves. You know, all of these things are uh, were things that needed to be purged from Chuck, the chubby version of him, and now this slimmed down version that Tom Hanks needed a year to to achieve um, is the the final essence of who he should be. You might say, and the final um, loss of Wilson there is that final piece being cleaved away of the island, of the underworld, you might say. Um, and also Wilson represents the fire, the refining fire. And so there's a sense that that death is now him, a, a baptism of sorts, a repentance of sorts. You know, there he is crying at the loss of a volleyball when before, you know, he didn't care about human beings at all. You know, so there's a sense that now Chuck is the, this is the unselfish 
version of Chuck. This is the Chuck that has been refined uh, by the sword and by the fire um, and now is worthy to sprout up and start living into his potential in the real world um, as opposed to um, whatever he was lacking in the beginning, you might say. So I think that's that's kind of how this Voyage and Return plot um, uh, wraps itself up. It wraps itself up with a with a, a, a kind of a, a death in the beginning, which is emerging into the underground world, the upside down world, and then another death, which is the death of that world back into the real world. But um, the process has this refining nature to it. By the time Andy Dufresne exits the Shawshank Redemption, whatever hangups he had in that very beginning, that very opening scene where he was drinking whiskey and had a gun in his um, in his car, uh, practically ready to commit a murder, that's gone. That old Andy has died uh, while he was at Shawshank. And the same thing with Chuck, you know, the, the person who's obsessed with time, uh, the person who uh, uh, really doesn't have his priorities straight, uh, you know, all of these upside down qualities of Chuck are gone by the time he emerges from the upside down world. So maybe you might say that that upside down world has a purpose uh, in our reality. You know, it, it, um, it is a process that we all go through. And I, I still think that there's something to do with the nature of what sleep and dreams do for us. Why is it that we are renewed after going to sleep and having a dream? Why does that cause a renewal? It's a little mini death and, and, and rebirth. Um, it's a way of processing all of the data in, in of, of sense data of the day and organizing it in your brain so that you can continue anew, uh, processing all of the chaos, uh, putting it in its right categories. That's, that's one theory of what dreams are. Um, and, and so this is a, a little version, a, a, a little... Uh, explanation of the pattern that we all have to do as human beings um, in order to continually renew ourselves and move forward and mature in life. I think that's what it is. Um, of course, I could go into so many different stories. I could show you scenes from Wizard of Oz and I could show you scenes from uh, Alice in Wonderland. And, you know, I kind of chose to to stick to Shawshank and, um, and cast away in this video. But, uh, but I think that wraps us up. So thanks for watching and leave a comment. Let me know what you think and check back and I'll, I'll keep, keep working through these, uh, through these plot types. Okay. Thanks.